uh, unit one, uh, two, three, and four, you can see the severe damage. Uh, yesterday we saw uh, a vapor coming out of unit four. Uh, you can see how the blasts have damaged the faces of these buildings. Uh, the face on unit one is still intact, really just the upper superstructure was gone. There's a, what we think is a vapor coming out of uh, unit three and uh, smoke coming out of unit two. Um, then uh, today, uh, this is a black and white photo and it shows uh, a better picture of, uh, of, again, what we have today. Uh, there's a little bit of evidence. We thought from this picture that there was no vapor visible in this plume, but let me show you. This is, this is really a black, uh, color photo uh, also taken, and now we do see some possible vapor coming out of Unit 3. Uh, something to point out is that the, uh, the, the, fueling, the spent fuel pools that are in uh, the, each unit, uh, have the the uh, fuel that's offloaded off the out of the core after after each refueling at each refueling outage. Once they have been in the pool in the unit for about a year and a half, they've cooled down sufficiently enough for them to transfer them to this larger common spent fuel pond. It's a, a very large pond that. Uh, holds uh, most of the, the uh, elements. And there's been no damage to this one. Uh, I haven't seen a good picture from the ground level, but, but, but this sits up higher than certainly the uh, seawater intakes do. Um, so, well, let me, well, I don't want to talk about that. You don't care that there's a difference between BWRs and BWRs. Uh, so this is a basic BWR system. Water is in there. This is the reactor vessel here. Water comes up through the reactor core, is, is, and it starts to boil when it's near the top. And it comes out of the top of the core and goes into a steam dryer assembly to remove excess of moisture. And then the, the steam that doesn't have moisture goes over here and dries the turbine that also drives a generator and that where the electricity is produced. Any of the excess steam uh, is, is condensed down here in a condenser that is cooled, it says here, from a river, but uh, it can be from the ocean, it can be from a lake, whatever the, the cooling uh, water is for the, the plant. And then the water that, that is condensed uh, is pumped back into the reactor where these jet pumps <coughs> control the flow of water through the reactor and therefore control the, uh, the, the power level of the reactor. <coughs> uh, there's a, re uh, a residual heat exchanger, excuse me, a heat, ex uh, heat uh, removal system that removes heat when the plant is shut down to remove the decay heat. This is, uses a, a pump that uh, needs electricity, and that was one of the things that, that didn't work. Real quickly, this is what the reactor pressure vessel looks like. The core is this orange area here in the middle. There's a large lower plenum where the water comes in. The uh, spent, I mean the um, control rods are down below. They drive in and out of the uh, vessel from below. Uh, this is the uh, upper plenum, which feeds into the steam dryers, and then the steam comes out here. This is what the fuel assemblies look like inside the core. These are four of the fuel assemblies that are arranged around a uh, cross that is a uh, control rod, and those are the control rods that can either uh, 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 that, that when they are removed from the core, uh, allow the reaction to the, the nuclear reaction to, to uh, generate heat. 
And uh, in the case of a scram or a shutdown, automatic shutdown, they are put up into the core, stopping all the nuclear reactions. And that uh, the, those operated successfully following the uh, sorry following the uh, the earthquake. So the plants were all shut down. This is a table, and I'm not going to go through it because it would take me quite a while, but it talks about the different ways to control the reactivity, the pressure in the reactor, the inventory, how do they remove decay heat, and what containment systems are. I think the thing to note is that except for a few of them, like this isolation condenser and for the Unit 1 and the reactor core isolation cooling system for Unit 2, uh, need... Uh, electric power to operate. And even these need uh, some power, uh, at least DC power, to operate valves to, to keep them running. Uh, there is a way to inject the essential service water, which is not a pure water system, into the vessel if, they, if need be. Uh, and if you had electric power, we, they did not have that. But they were able to connect the fire water system to the essential service water system, which was then connected into the, uh, the uh, primary system to put water in. And it's this fire water system that is uh, supplying the seawater directly from the ocean uh, the, through uh, these pumps into the, into the vessel to, uh, to maintain some level in them. Uh, this is a cutaway drawing of the reactor building, okay? And inside the reactor building, this is the vessel. This is the outside here is the, the dry well and the wet well, which make up the uh, primary containment vessel. Let me give you a better view uh, before I do that. I'm going to talk more about the containment later. I keep forgetting. I've got some pictures of the spent fuel pool is right located up here in the upper level of the reactor building, uh, just covered by this structure that we saw that was blown away in Unit 1. Uh, so let me talk just a little bit about the spent fuel pool. This is what the spent fuel pool looks like. You can see here's a person. This is It's a large volume of water. The fuel assemblies are taken out of the core, in a, in a, each one of those are put in a rack uh, that keeps the the, uh, the spent fuel separated enough so that you don't have to worry about criticality in this pool. Uh, and then there's pure water that is uh, uh, put over that pool. There is a system that removes heat, a heat exchanging system that removes heat from this core normally, I mean from this pool normally. And uh, in the case of this accident, when they lost the uh, off-site and the on-site power, they weren't able to cool these pools. The pool also uh, provides shielding, radiation shielding, from the reactivity uh, of the, uh, in the fuel uh, assemblies that are down here in the bottom. What can happen is, uh, following an accident, if you don't have uh, cooling, the, this pool can heat up, can eventually boil. Uh, we think that that could be what happened in Unit 4, is that the boiling in this pool caused uh, a steam reaction with the zirconium in the rods to generate hydrogen and therefore cause the explosion. But that's something we'll have to find out later when we actually know. Uh, another kind of picture, this is the containment vessel. Uh, the reactor vessel sits within it. During refueling, they remove the head of the core that, or of the reactor vessel up here and put it over here along with the, uh, uh, the dryers that were above the, the core. And then they remove the fuel and put it over in the spent fuel pool. So in, in Unit 4, they were, we think we're in this uh, configuration, so there was a lot of water there. Uh, so that's just to give you an idea. To go back to the reactor containment pressure vessel, this is a picture of actually the Browns Ferry uh, BWR that was being built. And I, and I think it illustrates the size of 
This is the the reactor pressure, yeah, the, excuse me, the containment pressure vessel, and the torus. The torus is connected through these pipes that are there. There's connections to allow various systems to, to penetrate the pressure vessel to get to the core to provide services inside there. This is the head that goes on top of the containment vessel. Uh, and so, uh, and then this whole area, then the building, the concrete building is built around it. So I just wanted to give you kind of a sense of scale. There's a person, I think, right there, people there. Uh, it's a very, very large structure. Uh, this is a cutaway of the reactor building. So now this is that steel pressure vessel, the reactor, uh, the reactor pressure vessel. It's, it's hard because they're both pressure vessels. They're both meant to withhold, to hold pressure. Uh, these, this is the torus over here. It goes all the way around. And so you can see how the reactor pressure, or I mean the containment pressure vessel, uh, gets embedded in the concrete, and then it is filled up with concrete around there that acts uh, both to support it, to provide shielding, and to make it stronger. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, spent fuel pool is up here. Uh, so uh, I think this is my last slide, yes, yeah, so I'm not going to go there. So what we kn know is when there is an accident in the core and the core can start to have damage, the, some of those fuel rods can actually start to swell and eventually crack. And inside the, each one of those fuel rods, uh, which have the fuel pins inside, the fuel pellets or pins or small uh, capsules that are inside with graphite, and those are about the, the width of a pencil, and then the fuel rods are, are, are big enough to hold them. Inside those fuel rods, are they, with, they contain the fission product gases. As fission products, as fission occurs, fission products are, are uh, generated. Uh, the, the ones that you always hear about are, are the cesium and the iodine. Those are contained, they're held with inside those fuel rods. If those fuel rods swell and crack, that's called fuel damage. It releases the fission product gases, and that's typically what we see following an accident. And then those fission product gases can go from the core when, it, when you depressurize it into the torus, and then when they're trying to, and, and the other thing that will happen is, is during that process of the, of the fuel elements swelling is that uh, it also generate hydrogen. And so, the, because of the reaction with the zirconium. And so hydrogen and fission product gases can, can collect in the torus, increasing the pressure if they try to relieve the pressure, which they tried to do. They try to do that through a filtered vent that's a high stack that, that filters out of the, the, these radionuclides out of the, uh, the release before it goes out of a very high stack, which causes uh, uh, significant dilution uh, when, it, when it's released. In this case, they, it appears they were not able to line up that vent path, and the hydrogen ended up here in the, uh, uh, in the reactor building causing the explosions up there, at least in units one and three. Um, and that's pretty much about what we know of the systems, or what we know of the accident in where we are at this point. And Graham gave a good a summary of, of, the, uh, uh, of where the status of everything is. So we can answer questions. I'll go sit down. Thank you. OK, again, please identify yourself. George, use the microphone. Graham, George John, Roddy, AP. George, there you are. <laughs> um, yesterday we had word from the DG that the situation had worsened. 
-hmm. Today, we have heard from you that it remains serious, but not significantly worse. Mm -hmm. Without too much speculation, is this a ray of hope? Is this a silver lining? Any other cliches I can use? Um, I think it's it's too early to, to, to say.